I guess we can start. So today I'm the moderator of the CHM seminar. My name is Niels Kürbis. I'm at the ethics and governance of AI branch of CHM. And today we are really excited to welcome John Donaha to our Center for Humans and Machines seminar series. Um, John is a senior lecturer in law at the National University of Ireland in Galway in the law school. He holds a BCL from University of uh, University College Cork, an LLM from Trinity College Dublin, and a PhD from University College Cork. Um, he was a lecturer in law at Keel University in the UK from 2011 till 2014 and joined the National University in Galway 2014. John does really some fascinating research on the ethical, legal, and social implications of new technology. And you can read all about it in his academic publications or in his blog, which is called Philosophical Disquisitions. And I particularly recommend his podcast that has the same name. And it has great guests. I mean, among others, there was Mark Kockelberg, who, uh, whose book we actually discussed in our last science meeting. So for those of you who joined last Friday and want to find out a little bit more about it, you can check it out. Uh, John's talk today is entitled Understanding Techno-Moral Revolutions. So without further ado, the floor is yours, John. Yeah, thanks a lot, Niels. And I'll just start sharing my screen. Oh, sorry. Um, share button. I haven't used WebEx before, actually, so this is the first time using this. I seem to have used most of the online platforms, but not this one for now. Yeah, we're, we're the, the one. <laughs> The one You're concerned about <laughs> security exactly. issues or something. Exactly. Okay. All right. Exactly. So can you see that okay? Yes, it's now in full screen. Oh, sorry. It was. Can you, so can you see it or is it? Uh, uh, now it's black. Now we see it again. Okay. All right. And is it? It's moving forward. Yeah. It is. Just so now, I can yeah. be sure because I I can't see what you're doing now anymore. Um, so I'm I'm just looking at my own screen. Yeah. So yeah. the title of my talk is. Um, understanding techno moral revolutions and this is going to be a somewhat eclectic talk uh, just a, a series of questions and some answers to them it's deals with a kind of ongoing research project that i have if you're interested in a slightly more worked out version of some of my comments here i wrote a paper recently called um, axiological futurism it's available in a journal called futures which sort of maps out this field of inquiry and why it's worth pursuing so i'm taking up some themes from that paper, along with some new material that I've been researching in the past sort of 12 months or so. Okay. So the, the opening questions for this talk are, you know, can technology transform social morality? I think I'm probably talking to the right group when it comes to that question. You probably already have an answer to that question. But more specifically, can we speculate meaningfully about future changes in, in social morality. So how technology will change social morality in the future. You know, prediction is very hard, particularly when it's about the future, to quote Niels Bohr, another famous Niels. And um, you know, there's this issue here about you know, can we actually say anything meaningful about possible future uh, moralities. And so what I want to try and do is consider maybe some mechanisms of moral change, the way in which technology precipitates or facilitates moral change that might help us to uh, speculate meaningfully about future moral changes. I'll start with this a story or a parable that kind of illustrates the theme. And this is a painting by the English artist, John Millet of a medieval knight. And so you know, medieval knights uh, are associated with the feudal system typically, which was a kind of social moral paradigm, which predominated in Europe in the middle ages. And, you know, the thing about the feudal system was that mounted knights had a very central role in that society. They were the most powerful armed unit, fighting unit. They were rewarded and honored by the system. They were given property, certain duties were owed to them. They owed certain duties to people who were higher up in the feudal pyramid. Um, so the, the whole feudal system had this kind of rather a rich and elaborate set of moral rules. And where did it come from? Uh, how did we get this system? Well, you know, there's lots of different theories of this, but there's one famous causal explanation of why the feudal system arose in Europe that I want to consider. And it claims that the invention of these things, 
was the sort of crucial technological precursor to the feudal system with its rich set of social moral behaviors and norms, right? And so it's the stirrup, the iron stirrup that allowed for mounted knights to become an effective fighting unit. And so the historian Lynn White Jr. in his book that he wrote back in the 60s, which I highly recommend if you haven't read it, it's quite an interesting study of, of medieval technology and social change, claims in, in the first chapter of that book that the stirrup was the invention that created the feudal system. Okay, so the stirrup, as he says here, by giving lateral support, in addition to the front and back support offered by pommel and cantle, effectively welded horse and rider into a single fighting unit capable of violence without precedent. The fighter's hand no longer delivered the blow, it merely guided it. The stirrup thus replaced human energy with animal power and immensely increased the warrior's ability to damage his enemy. So um, because mounted knights became such an effective fighting unit, as a result of the invention of the stirrup, they became important in society and the feudal system sort of assembled around their importance in the kind of military uh, society at the time. Right now, you know, the people who criticize Lynn White's thesis here is it's too deterministic, but I think it's an interesting story about how a single technology in this instance can precipitate significant social moral changes. And that's the kind of thing that I'm interested in understanding is how does this thing, this kind of thing happen? So just to kind of start answering that, consider that question, let me start with a kind of motivational question first, you know, why would you want to study this topic, particularly studying future moral revolutions? Okay, how, how things are going to change in the future? Uh, well, it would help initially if we had some kind of definition or clarification of what we're trying to study. What is a moral revolution? And since I have a semi-philosophical background or at least disposition, I like to, to find and characterize things at the outset. So for my purposes, I think of, mo of a moral revolution as a, a reasonably significant change in social moral beliefs and practices and, and what people believe is good, which we call the axiological branch of morality. So beliefs and practices that people have around what is valuable, what is not valuable, what is good, what is bad. And deontology, which is not deontological ethics in the Kantian sense, which some of you might be familiar with, but rather just the, the general set of rules and principles about what is right and wrong. Okay. So in my mind, morality consists of these two things, an axiology, a set of beliefs about what is good and bad, and a deontology, a set of beliefs about what is right and wrong, permissible, impermissible, forbidden, obligatory, that kind of thing. And you can have revolutions in either form of morality. So it's a significant change in what people believe to be good and bad, and how they behave in relation to those things, and a change in what people believe is, is right and wrong. And so a moral revolution is a, a significant change in axiological or deontological beliefs. Now, you know, a lot of people have written about moral revolutions in the past couple of decades, some quite interesting books written even in the past couple of years about the phenomenon. It's a kind of growing area of scholarly interest. And the terminology is, I think, a bit of a mess. So you know, people disagree about what counts as a revolution, what doesn't count as a revolution in morality. I mean, the, the term revolution has certain connotations in people's minds and people think it should only be employed in certain areas. Now this mightn't be interesting to you, but just try and cut through some of that terminological complexity here. There's one work by a guy called Robert Baker called The Structure of Moral Revolutions, which is actually modeled on a famous work in the philosophy of science called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn, for anyone who gets the reference. And he distinguishes between uh, different kinds of social moral change. So he talks about revolutions being intentional or guided changes in social morality. So there's actually some group of revolutionaries that want to change social morality in some way. Um, he, he doesn't actually talk about this category much, but it's sort of implied within his framework, uh, kind of evolution is some sort of predictive, maybe even adaptive change in social morality. And then also what he calls moral drift, just kind of random, non-adaptive changes in social moralities. So a lot of changes in social moral behavior are just the kind of 
for, product of random social forces or technological forces. The non-intentionally directed and some of them are intentionally directed. Uh, another complexity, that, so the, the issue here when we use the term revolution is that it might tell us something already about the mechanism of moral change and in Baker's framework it tells us that it's an intentional mechanism of moral change. The other issue that arises from my discussions of this is that the term revolution usually signifies in people's minds a very substantive or dramatic change in social morality. And not all changes in morality that we're interested in are necessarily dramatic or paradigm shifting or paradigm changing, kind of adopt the um, Kuhnian language from the structure of scientific revolutions. So I think, you know, probably more useful to think about different types of moral change along this sort of simple, you know, two by two matrix here, one kind of axis referring to the mechanism, whether it is intentionally directed or non-intentionally caused, and also then the magnitude of change, okay? And so you can think about these four sort of categories of things. These are just labels that I somewhat arbitrarily chose. You think about moral reforms as being intentional changes to some limited set of moral behaviors and practices and beliefs, I should say. Um, you think about moral revolutions as being more significant changes, moral drift as being non-intentional changes in some narrow set of behaviors and practices, and then moral transformations as being more significant changes. I'm not going to sweat the terminology too much. Some of you might find that framework interesting. I'm, I'm interested more in the general phenomenon of all sort of changes in social morality, and in particular, I'm interested in non-intentional mechanisms of change. Uh, specifically how you know, technology influences um, social moral behavior. And just another kind of terminological point here is that when we're studying moral revolutions or moral change, in my mind, that is not the same thing as studying improvements in moral behavior. It's sort of a descriptive inquiry, not a directly normative inquiry. Um, so other people talk about moral progress as being positive moral change. So you might want to study moral progress, but in my mind, I'm interested in both things, so moral progress and moral regress, because oftentimes societies fall into patterns of immoral behavior as a result of different social and technological forces. Okay, so that's just a terminological point. To go back to the other question I asked originally, which is, you know, why would you want to study this? What's the value of it? Like, I think there's some obvious, you know, predictive or pragmatic value to trying to anticipate or study future moral changes. One is we want to plan for different scenarios and anticipate changes. And we often want to know what's going to happen in the future. So why wouldn't we want to know what's going to happen with our moral beliefs and practices in the future? It's just a kind of natural part of that general curiosity about the future. There is, however, also, I think, a, a moral significance, a normative significance to the study of moral revolutions and moral changes. So the fact that social morality changes over time, and we have seen this historically that it has changed, and it'll probably change again in the future, I think could induce one of two attitudes to, uh, in us. It could induce a kind of humility or uncertainty about our current moral beliefs and practices. Maybe we are clinging to a set of moral beliefs and practices that will be viewed as abhorrent or antiquated in the future. And so maybe we shouldn't be too attached to them. It may also induce a kind of moral conservatism. We might fear future moral changes and do our best to uh, cling on to what we currently have. And also, you know, the fact that there are moral disruptions and moral changes does a kind of harm to our moral agency as well, our capacity to make moral decisions, is that because we have to factor in changes in morality too. On the first of those issues, you know, the, the, the normative significance of, of moral uncertainty or moral humility. Again, there's a, a growing literature on this topic of moral uncertainty that I think is very interesting and has a lot of interesting ramifications for anyone who's studying disruptive technologies. But a kind of extreme version of the argument here, I take from um, an author called, uh, I think it's Evan Williams, who wrote a paper back in 2015 about uh, the possibility of an ongoing moral catastrophe. And uh, he, he made a simple inductive argument to say that the, one concern we might have, given the history of moral change, is that we are all currently complicit in an ongoing moral catastrophe of, catastrophe of some kind. Okay, and this is the argument that he has in the paper outlined on the screen. You know, we have reason to think that the present and the future will be like the past. 
members of past societies were unknowingly complicit in ongoing moral catastrophes, such as slavery, denial of rights to women, LGBTQ communities, and so forth. Um, therefore, it's quite likely that members of present societies are unknowingly complicit in ongoing moral catastrophes. And so that, that might again induce this humility about what our current moral beliefs and practices are. And we might try to try, you know, anticipate ways in which morality might change in the future and things that our ancestors might look back on with a degree of shame as to what we currently believe. I suppose I personally often think about factory farming as a potential example of this as a, an ongoing moral catastrophe that future generations might not look so kindly on us for. Okay. So I think this will give us kind of motivation for trying to study um, moral revolutions and changes. We want to try and reduce the risk of complicity in some kind of ongoing moral catastrophe. We might want to speed up perceived desirable changes in social morality. We might want to slow down undesirable ones. And more generally, we might want to adopt a stance of moral openness. So again, not too attached to what our current social morality is, but open to potential changes and improvements in our moral beliefs and practices. Okay, so that's just sort of definitional questions and motivational issues out of the way. What about the actual mechanics of moral change? How might technology change morality in the future? So this is the main substance of what I, I wanted to talk about uh, with you today. And so there's two things that I think are worth trying to understand if you want to predict or plan for potential future moral changes. One is you want to try and understand the space of moral possibility and then the mechanisms of change within that space of possibility. So what I mean by the space of moral possibility is, you know, what are all the possible moral systems out there? Now, you might think that's a question that's impossible to answer, but this is sort of one of the things that I've dedicated a lot of time recently to try to figure out. Uh, I'm not saying that I have perfect answers to it, but again, if you think about morality as consisting of an axiological element, so a set of values and as a, de a deontological element, a set of um, principles of right and wrong action, there's kind of a limited number of potential changes to those things, right? So like when you think about values that people have, there's a limited number of changes that are possible. We can add values, we can subtract values, or we can change the way in which we prioritize different things. Okay, so we might have a flat ranking of values, we might have some hierarchy of values, we can shuffle around the order of those. And when, when it comes to deontology, you know, something that was once forbidden can become permissible, something that was once optional might become now obligatory. Okay, so you think about changes in sexual morality in recent past, things that were once deemed impermissible have become uh, permissible to some extent. Okay. Uh, and vice versa, some things that were once permissible have become impermissible. There's also I think, a lot of work on kind of human psychology and the evolution of morality, which might suggest that there is a limited space to possible moral systems. There's some very interesting work uh, done by Oliver Scott Curry on the theory of morality as cooperation, which I've looked at a bit, which suggests that there's a kind of finite set of um, possible moral systems. And actually, they, his, himself and his colleagues have published an interesting paper recently about kind of moral combinatorics, looking at all the different possible systems of cooperative morality out there, which I recommend reading. I also, um, I have written a summary of it, and I've interviewed him on my podcast, if you want to pursue that in more detail. But I'm going to set to one side this discussion of moral possibility and focus instead on mechanisms of change. Okay, so how... How do we move about within the space of moral possibility? What causes us to change? And more particularly, what, uh, what kind of impact does technology have on our position within the possible space of morality? So, I mean, this is how I think about it in you know, very abstract terms, okay? And this is kind of, I guess, a, a methodologically individualistic perspective on it, which is that ultimately changes in the brain and what people believe to be right and wrong and good and bad and how they behave. That's sort of what you're ultimately interested in or primarily interested in those changes. But those changes are caused by a confluence of different 
forces. You know, evolution has shaped a certain basic capacity for moral conscience, your individual developmental history, the culture that you were born into and so forth, that will add a lot more content to that basic capacity for moral conscience. In the future, you know, technology creates new possibilities for action that change how we behave, that could develop new norms and practices, our cultural institutions could change. And of course, you know, another important thing is the environment in which we live has new challenges and constraints for us that requires us to adapt and change our moral system. So I think about all of these things as being part of the mechanisms that alter uh, moral beliefs and practices. But I'm gonna get focused just specifically on technology for now, right? So what, what role does technology play in shaping different moral systems? And you know, there's a number of different ways to go and there are things to look at here. But what I'm going to do uh, for the remainder of the talk is just look at changes on a kind of individual perceptive and behavioral level, and then also changes at a kind of social relational level. All right. So when it comes to changes at an individual perceptual level, I'm going to draw a bit on this theory of the technological mediation of morality by Peter Paul Rabic. So he's been writing about this topic for I don't know, more than 20 years, and there's a number of different formulations of it. And he's developed this theory of the technological mediation of morality. And the main idea behind it is summarized in this quote here that technologies help to establish relationships between human beings and their environment. And in these relationships, technologies are not just silent intermediaries between you know, human intentions and purposes, but they are rather active mediators that help to constitute the entities that have a relationship through technology. And so by organizing relations between humans and the world, technologies play an active, though not a final role in morality. So he's not a, a technological determinist or fatalist here. Um, so he's not saying that technology just necessarily changes moral beliefs and practices in a particular direction, which is kind of what Lynn White could be criticized for in his theory about the stirrup causing the feudal system. It seems like a very simple, you know, linear uh, causal story. But the idea here is that technologies do shape our moral beliefs and practices in some way, even if we, there's other factors that influence it too. So how exactly does this change? Well, again, Rubik has a number of different formulations of this, but one framework is distinguishes between two main kinds of technological mediation of moral beliefs and practices. One is simply pragmatic mediation. The technology changes the space of options and actions available to us and their associated costs and benefits. So technology can make options available to us that were once unavailable. And technology can also, perhaps less commonly, close off options that were once available to us. So the image on the screen is just a simple example of this, you know, the invention of something like the, the automobile or the car changes the options available to you when you want to go and meet a friend of yours. You can walk, that's the standard traditional solution to the problem, or you can drive. It's a, a new option, you can get there quicker, it means you can leave later. So it changes your behaviors around that practice, okay? Technology can also potentially, you know, take options away. And an example here that might be tied to automobiles would be something like the invention of an alcohol interlock system on a car that prevents you from driving while drunk. So it takes that option away from you. However, I think in general, the tendency is for technology to add more choices to our lives, add more options to our lives. And this kind of means that technology tends to increase the moral complexity of our lives because it means we have more potential dilemmas, things that we should or shouldn't do. Should I call my friend? Should I text back immediately uh, now that I have that option? Of course, you know, in the old days, I wouldn't have had that option. Should I be looking at my email all the time um, or not? So it, it, technology tends to add complexity. Where it takes away options, it's usually taking away an option that was already given to us by technology. So technology gave us the option of driving while drunk and the alcohol interlock takes that away. Or if you install internet blocking software on your laptop, it takes away the option of connecting online, which was an option that was created by technology. So that's that general phenomenon of pragmatic mediation. And that can have an impact on our moral choices. Just a interesting case study of this, uh, which I, isn't mine, I took it from 
a couple of economics scholars, um, is the impact of contraception on the ethics of extramarital sex, okay, so sex outside of marriage. Um, the, the authors actually use the term premarital sex in their work, but I think extramarital is more appropriate. So this comes from a, a book specifically by Jeremy Greenwood, although it's based on research that he did with others over the years. And it says, you know, you can think about the profound changes in the ethics of extramarital sex over the course of the 20th century from being, you know, forbidden and frowned upon to being essentially permitted in most societies. And to the extent that there's any kind of lingering hostility towards it, it tends to be ignored in practice. So it, it's still the case that religious institutions um, and certain cultural institutions frown upon it, but most kind of young people ignore the strictures of religion in practice. And, and they have some interesting studies actually on the attitudes of young people towards religious morality in relation to extramarital sex in some of their, their papers, which is worth looking at. And so what they argue is that most of that change in the ethics of extramarital sex is due to technology, specifically the invention of cheap and effective methods of contraception, and also then the availability of uh, legal and safe methods of abortion. Okay, so they actually do a calculation of this and they look at studies done on the effectiveness of different methods of contraception and the likelihood of um, conceiving a child out of wedlock in the year 1900 in the US and then they compare it to the year 2000 and these are the actual figures from their paper. So the decision in the year 1900 um, to have sex or not outside of marriage was uh, if you chose to have sex, you had a, a, a woman specifically, obviously, or a female, um, would have a 45 to 80%, 85% chance of pregnancy within one year, okay? Now, the, the range of outcomes there is based on the available methods of contraception at the time. Okay, so 85% if uncontracepted, you could go as low as a 45% chance if you availed of certain methods of, of contraception that were available. If you compare that then to the um, situation in the year 2000, and again, these are actual figures um, based on kind of surveys of people and um, kind of medical studies of this, that you, know, you mentioned things like the pill, and more effective latex condoms and so forth, reduced the chances of um, conception outside of marriage to around five to 15%. It could be a lot higher for some people too, if they you know, were much more careful in following the instructions, but. That was sort of the general population level data. So there's a dramatic uh, decrease in the unwanted costs of extramarital sex. And uh, this, they argue, explains most of the change in social morality. And that would be an example here of pragmatic moral mediation. The invention of technologies changed, changed the moral calculus, the moral decisions available to us. Okay. The other type of mediation that um, Verbeek refers to is hermeneutic mediation. So hermeneutic mediation, and this is the thing that he's more famous for and more interested in, has to do with changes in how we perceive and understand aspects of the real world, in particular, the concepts and analogies that we apply to it. And this can have an, a significant impact on our moral decision-making by changing our moral concepts and values. So this image on screen will look pretty odd, but it, it's because his main example of hermeneutic technological moral mediation is the invention of obstetric ultrasound, which he argues changes the relationship between prospective parents and their unborn child. So I'll just quote directly from something he said about this. So the technology of obstetric ultrasound by revealing the unborn to the parents in terms of variables that mark its health condition like the fold and the nape of the neck of the fetus, ultrasound translates the unborn child into a possible patient, congenital diseases uh, into preventable forms of suffering, provided that abortion is available, and expecting a child into choosing for a child, also after the conception. So, I mean, the idea here is that not by itself, but in conjunction with other social and cultural forces, this technology changes how we morally perceive the unborn child. And this is something that he personally felt, I think, quite profoundly when he um, viewed his kind of unborn child to a, 
an obstetric ultrasound. Okay, um, so that's kind of hermeneutic mediation. Are there other examples of this in practice? So there's a number that I'm kind of interested in. This is more sort of tied to some of my own ongoing research is you know, how technology changes our moral perception of things, and in particular, our perceived value of things. So most things that we value, we tend to value for intrinsic reasons, reasons that are inherent to the thing itself, and for instrumental reasons, because it gets us something else, okay? So you can think about the technology of social media and the smartphone as hermeneutically mediating our moral relationship to our experiences, our day-to-day -day experiences, okay? So whereas once upon a time, if you attended a, con a concert, you would just enjoy the experience of being at the concert with whoever happened to be there with you. Now you don't just have that option anymore. You have the option of recording it, archiving it, sharing it, and monetizing it. And that potentially changes the way in which you value it, okay? It's, you don't just value the occurrent experience itself of being at the concert, listening to the music. You value the opportunity to connect with other people using your smartphone or archiving and sharing the experience for others in the future. So there's maybe an increased instrumental value to your experience. And this, of course, has a negative impact as well. And people talk about this as of taking you away from the moment. Okay, but it's an example, I think, of, kind of I, I guess, a combination of hermeneutic mediation and pragmatic mediation. The, the smartphone adds an option, which also changes how we perceive the value of the experience. Another example, and this is actually, this is something that I've tried to write a longer piece on, but I won't go into it in too much detail right now, is um, the changes in our moral perception of ourselves and the behaviors that we think we ought to follow or the rules that we think that we ought to follow. So this is an idea I take from a colleague of mine, Henrik uh, Setra, who talks about the distinction between ratomorphy and robotomorphy. So ratomorphy, which he took from somebody that I can't remember their name, is this idea that the persistent use of the rat as an experimental model on scientists encourages us to see the human as something like a rat as being rat-like in certain crucial respects, right? And vice versa, it encourages us to see the, the rat as human-like in some respects, but also the metaphor works both ways. And so Setra argues that this can happen as well with robots. You can have robotomorphy, the persistent and pervasive use of robots in both experimental and social settings, it encourages us to see the humans as a kind of robot, to see ourselves as robot-like, okay? And that means that we see ourselves as mechanistic, as subject to the same kind of rules or um, principles as machines ought to be subject to. And this is building upon a very long tradition, by the way, in cognitive science as well, of seeing the human mind as being like a computer. So initially, the computer is modeled on a human mind or human thought, if you look at the work of, of Turing and von Neumann. But then subsequently, the computer itself becomes a kind of metaphor for how the human mind works that the human mind is computational in certain fundamental respects. So Setra is using the same idea in this notion of hermeneutic mediation of looking back on ourselves, viewing ourselves as being like robots. So what impact could that have on our social morality? Well, I mean, there's a number of potential impacts and I won't go into all of them, but here's one kind of hypothesis that I think would be worth exploring in more detail, would be the impact of certain studies on moral asymmetry between humans and robots and that the impact that that will have on our kind of beliefs about the rules, the moral rules that we ought to follow. Some of you would be familiar with this work um, from Bertram Mal and his colleagues about the asymmetry effect uh, initially discovered through these simple comparisons of people's judgment in trolley style dilemmas, what rules do they think a robot should follow versus what kind of rule a human actor should follow in that situation. And the initial finding is that the expectation is that robots follow a more utilitarian set of norms. So, you know, minimizing harm as opposed to following kind of deontological duties towards other people. This is backed up in a couple of other studies since then. Um, uh, kind of a follow up suggesting that the more mechanical a robot appears to be, the more asymmetrical the moral standards that apply to it. And another one on kind of these military drones, suggesting that robots are less likely to perceive, be perceived as needing to follow the hierarchical moral norms within a command structure like the military. 
and again should follow a more utilitarian mode of reasoning. Uh, so what, you know, what effect does that have on us? If, so if this is how we think robots should behave, applying this hermeneutic model that we perceive ourselves as being robot-like in certain respects, we might think that this means that we, uh, this might lead to an outcome where we think that we should be more utilitarian in our behavior too. And this might be one of the impacts of the increased robotization of um, society on human morality. And in fact, we can see some hints to this effect already, some ethicists who make this claim that we should be more robot-like in our behavior. So I've just taken this as an example, as a quote from a paper by Sven Nehom and Yilis Smits on automated driving. And it talks about how, you know, a lot of the traffic, so to speak, in the debate about automated driving is that it, uh, the machines should adapt to human behaviors. But what they argue in their paper is that that's not the only way it should go. Sometimes it may be the case that humans should adapt to machines and should become more machine-like in their own driving behavior. So if it's the case that you choose to drive when you have the option of using a, an automated vehicle and the automated vehicle is proven to be safer, you should adopt a more machine-like mode of driving. So be much stricter in the way in which you follow the rules of the road, for example. And so that's what they argue in this paper. And that'll be an example of this mechanism I'm talking about, but thinking that we should follow the same rules as machines follow, as opposed to the other way around. Okay, um, so a couple more things to talk about. Um, so I think I probably have enough time for maybe one or two of these before I could hand over to questions. So that, that's just looking at it at kind of an individualistic level about how the mechanisms of moral change at an individual level, this kind of pragmatic mediation and hermeneutic mediation. What about the impact of technology and power relations and networks? Well, you know, there's a very popular influential theory about the origins of human morality, human moral psychology and the moral conscience from um, Michael Tomasello and others, which places a lot of emphasis on social roles and role responsibility in the origins of our moral systems is that, you know, we think of ourselves as occupying different social roles. There are different duties that attach to them and the capacity to project ourselves into the other social roles that gives rise to this notion of kind of moral conscience of holding other people to account, blaming them if they do something wrong, praising them if they do something right and so forth. Okay. So there's a, an industrial sociologist called Stephen Barley, who's written a bit about this, not using the exact same framework as Tomasello, same basic idea, where he applies the dramaturgical theory of human social life to how technology affects norms within the workplace. Okay, so in all encounters, actors enact some role following at least some minimal set of cultural expectations about how, where, with what, and with whom the role should be played. So to understand how technology becomes ent entwined with and alters our ways of organizing, we need to attend to the situated, patterned, and recurrent ways of behaving and interacting that mark a particular context. So I mean, to kind of boil this down to a simpler version without quoting Embassy from his book, his claim is that technology is at its most disruptive to social morality when it has the power to change the roles enacted by people within a social setting particularly by changing the balance or imbalance in their relative moral burdens and or by increasing or reducing the power of one role relative to another. Okay, and so he, one of his studies on this is looking at the impact of the internet on car dealerships and car sales process, okay. So the historical method of purchasing a car is I guess particularly a kind of US cultural model um, is, you know, buying a car from a salesperson in a, a dealership is a pretty unpleasant experience, unless you're super knowledgeable about cars. It's a highly unequal interaction. The dealer has a lot more knowledge than you do, and they can avail of numerous props, such as other people who work with them, to force you into a sale that you probably didn't want. And the goal of that traditional interaction is to basically have as high margin of profit as you can on each sale. Okay, so Barley in a interesting kind of ethnographic study looks at, at Californian car dealerships in the early 2000s to sort of late 2000s 
and argues that the internet changed the social script for car sales and the relationship between the dealer and the purchaser into a more equal relationship, more information symmetric, and the salesperson was ultimately forced to adopt a more honest approach. Okay, so this is kind of a positive impact of technology. The internet disrupted the traditional social script, took away a lot of the context of a car dealership, and resulted in a more equal interaction. So I'm interested in the same thing when it comes to automation, the impact of automating technologies on our social relationships and hierarchies. And obviously it's, that's too broad a question to give a very detailed answer to right now. But you know, one thing that I think is obvious about automating technologies, like they say personally, assistance software and that kind of thing, is it tends to reduce our dependency on proximate others, the people that we interact with on a daily basis in our lives. Uh, and also reduces our need to interact with people in some social settings. So if you think about you know, self-help kiosks where you check out at a shop, uh, you don't have to interact with a salesperson anymore. You can interact with the machine instead. So it reduces that kind of dependency, but it also then increases our dependency on distal others and obviously increases the power of certain owners of the technological infrastructure. So it has this interesting shift on kind of roles and behaviors in a social setting. And um, this can have, I think, have a trickle down effect then on our social morality. The last point I wanted to make then, this is just a very quick point, is so those are the kind of three mechanisms of uh, techno moral change that might be useful for projecting into the future pragmatic mediation, hermeneutic mediation, and this impact on social roles and disruption of social roles. Is there a more generally a kind of pattern to techno-moral revolutions, a kind of arc or trajectory that they follow? This is necessarily a much more speculative idea, but one framework that I think is useful is Carlotta Perez's model of technological revolutions. So, she, I mean, she's looking specifically at how technologies impact economic behavior, but there's obviously a significant overlap between economic behavior and moral behavior, you know, how we exchange things with one another, how, who owns what, all these things are very relevant to social morality too. So she argues it follows this trajectory where you have what she calls an eruption phase. So a new technology bursts onto the scene with lots of possibilities, lots of new ways of doing business, something like the invention of the computer or the invention of the steam engine. There follows a frenzy, people kind of rush in to use this new technology, explore different um, kind of social uses of it. This creates a bit of chaos in society, which leads to a kind of turning point or moral crisis in society. The old norms and behaviors don't work anymore, so we need to develop something new. And so then we shift into what she calls the synergy and maturity phases, where kind of the institutions adapt to the new technology, a new kind of set of social moral rules becomes normalized, and then we enter a mature phase. And also, then also in her framework, we necessarily enter another sort of crisis or disruption because a new technological paradigm comes on scene. And I mean, I don't know how useful this kind of pattern framework is for understanding technological moral revolutions, but you know, it, it might be one way of understanding where we currently are in relation to, let's say, what I'm, what I'm calling here surveillance capitalist technology. That was kind of deployed very widely in the past sort of 20, 30 years. We've reached a certain crisis with that, and we see new kind of social moral paradigms emerging, new regulatory frameworks emerging that might result in increased kind of synergy or harmony between human behavior and that kind of technological disruption. I mean, there are other, there are problems with thinking about social moral development in this patterned way, which we can talk about, but oh leave it there for now. So thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions or comments.